this is, this is, this is. Uh, I, you know, I have questions. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Go, let's go. You know, I was thinking the other day. I was thinking, like, is is it just me, or do do I learn something and then forget it later, or did I never really learn it, or did I did I see something and then forget about it, but it actually happened? See, like, I I don't think I have the same memory as as you, but uh, Massimiliano, Massimiliano, is that what it is? Yeah, it's, yeah, Massimiliano. Very I've good. always called you Mass, as as That's it's always I go by. easier. So you still go by Mass. <laughs> yeah. Cool, cool. Well, thank you for taking the time. I'm excited. We have, we've never talked. We've met a long time ago. We were talking a little bit before we started recording about how we met in Seattle. So let's just get back into there, and then I'd love to just talk about what you've been up to. Great. Yeah, yeah. I remember. Uh, in fact, the reason I was even there because why would I be at a show in Seattle that I'm not playing, right? And yeah. The reason I was there was because, well, first of all, my brother was living there for a while. And uh, actually several years, he did a PhD in molecular genetics at uh, um, UW. Mm. And uh, I went, I was there visiting him. And then two bands that I produce were playing at that show, um, Teen Idols, and I produced all their albums. And then mm. um, Anti-Flag, I produced some, mastered others, did a combination of mixing and mastering and engineering on others. I mean, basically I've been working with them since 2000. So, you know, they were in town and I went to see both those friends of mine plus i know less than jake even though i haven't directly worked with them i, I know those guys and, yeah. and that's why i was there yeah <laughs> but uh yeah my brother lived there in fact i think he was involved with a band that was connected with your old label that you guys used to be on at the beginning um uh called blenderhead oh blenderhead yeah that our first tour ever was with blenderhead oh and flav played guitar in that band for a little while i mean it was I don't think he ever toured or did an album with them, but I think for a year or so he was playing at local shows with Blenderhead. So. Okay, what, <laughs> what's brother. his name? What's your brother's name? Flav. Flaviano Flav. is his full name, but he goes by Flav. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to have to ask my guys if we've ever met Flav, but I, it doesn't ring a bell because, you know, we, we thinking back to the past, it's funny because so much happened, but it was usually in a very short amount of time like one year we did like you know three tours and an album you're just like how did we do that then you know but uh <laughs> that's interesting you know it's funny you know you, you were talking about your brother doing a phd for those that don't know can we just do a quick recap you're, you're not only a producer you've produced so many great punk rock records uh you your, your band squirt gun uh you're the bass player you fellow bass player, which is cool. Uh, but you're not only that, but you have a lot going on in the academics world. So can we just touch on that a little bit and then we'll get into punk rock, we'll get into records, we'll get into yeah. everything. But like, just hearing you talk about your brothers, you know, doing a PhD and then now he's in Blenderhead for a little while. Like, the <laughs> clashing of all you smart uh, Georginis, if, you, if I, you know, and then going into punk rock like it's uh it's kind of insane so i'm just i guess what i just don't realize is how could i miss this like we met so long ago uh we kind of got swept away you know there was a, a big crowd um and then i just haven't talked to you since really so <laughs> it's great to have you back it's great to uh to get into it but yeah please please let's let's tell everybody i was just watching your ted talk so can you get into a little bit about your academics? Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Well, it was kind of an accident how I got there. You know, um, I was on tour. I, I was also in a band called Common Rider. Um, the singer was Jesse Michaels, who's best known for Operation Ivy. Mm -hmm. you know, he was in Operation Ivy for its short, you know, but glorious uh, lifespan um, and lead singer. And one day he gets in touch with me like 10 years after um, Op Ivy breaks up. He calls me. Now, we met when Op Ivy was together because I put on a show for them and we really hit it off. So he decides to come out of retirement, do a new band, and he contacts me and asks me to play bass. And so we ended up working on a lot of songs together. Obviously, chord progressions, lyrics, they're all completely Jesse Michaels, his melodies. But then he gave us, and by us I mean Dan Lumley, who also was in um, Squirk and Screeching Weasel with me because I was in Screeching Weasel for nine years as well. Um, so he just let us kind of go with it. And Dan and I immerse ourselves in a lot of um, 
reggae from the island period, rock steady, you know, Jamaican era stuff, and then also some of the more rock blended things. And anyway, um, besides all that, we you know stuff. All of a sudden, when I got back from that Common Rider tour, during the tour that I was out there with with the van, I was starting to read a lot of books again. Like I got, in, I fell in love with reading books, and one of them was Don Quixote in English. And at the end of the tour, um, I get a call from Purdue, um, a professor that I knew named Ben Lawton, not Bin Laden, but Ben Lawton, okay. who is another crazy kind of character because he um, was a retired lieutenant colonel from the army. He taught hand-to-hand combat and had many, many medals from Vietnam and things like that. But he called me and said, look, Mass, I know you grew up speaking Italian. It's your first language. And I said, yeah, it's the first language. That's true. And I spoke it at home every day until I was 18. He said, okay. And I know that you have a bachelor's in something, don't you? And I said, well, yeah, I've got a bachelor's in psychology. He goes, I want you to come and teach Italian for me. Okay. "Uh, (laughs) Well, I mean, you know, I've got a career and I'm about to go on tour. And he goes, well, you look into that, but you kind of owe me a small favor. In fact, I did. (laughs) He did did me a couple of big favors. And so I'm like, okay, what the heck? I'll do it one semester. So there was a tour I was working on to Japan with Squirt Gun. I just said, cancel. Um, I'll go teach these two classes for... For the university and being there i didn't get much of a benefit because i was a part-timer i was what they call an adjunct you know so mm-hmm. what benefit did i get i could take free classes so i'm like wow they're going to be offering a class on don quixote <laughs> <laughs> and it was taught by this professor um, professor howard manson who is one of the top 10 most famous cervantes scholars in the world and i'm like i gotta take it so I signed up for it. And then as I was turning in my papers to the graduate office, he said, do you know that this is Spanish? And I'm like, well, yeah. Do you speak Spanish? I'm like, no. And he goes, well, it's not just Spanish. It's for PhD students in Spanish. And almost everyone in the class is a native speaker. And I'm like, I've got a, three weeks or so to learn it, right? I can learn Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> So I did a crash and I just started listening to Spanish audio stuff and looking at books. And I had a roommate from Mexico at the time and she just said, okay, I'll just speak to you in Spanish for three weeks. We'll see what happens. And it took a lot of work because I would read the chapter that we were doing in class the night before in English. And then I would try to read it slowly in Spanish, look up all the words I didn't know. Keep in mind, this is Spanish from 400 years ago, so it's also not modern. Mm. Obviously, my Italian helped a lot, but... Anyway, it ended up I got the highest grade in the class. And uh, of course you did. <laughs> the professor. You're the Rosetta said, Stone. He went like halfway through the semester, he comes, he calls me over and he goes, and he's speaking to me in Spanish, you know, but he says, Mass, you know, uh, I've been very impressed with your coursework, but so I was talking to one of my colleagues and none of us think you're even a student in this. What, how are you here? And I'm like, well, I don't really speak Spanish. And he says, what do you mean? You've been speaking it in class. Every day you offer some viewpoint on a chapter, and when I call on you, you always answer me in Spanish. You speak Spanish. I'm like, okay, well, I've never taken 101 or anything. I just kind of learned it myself the last month or so. He goes, how long have you been speaking? I'm like, well, I don't know, a month and a half. At that point. <laughs> he said, this is a graduate course for PhD students, and you're telling me that you've only been speaking a month and a half. And I went, yeah, yeah. And anyway, so he encouraged me and he said, you've got to do a doctorate or a master's or something. And ended up, I did the PhD. So, and what I did for my term paper, which was supposed to be, you know, 15 pages, I did an 85 page term paper. It went about 70 pages in. I said, I can't do everything I want to do because there's not enough time this semester. But here's an outline of the rest I want to do. And I wrote chapters and broke it down and did like a full outline for 15 pages. And he said, this is a dissertation mess. This is what you do for a PhD. And you've already almost written one in one semester. <laughs> wow. Just <laughs> intrinsically, you just did that. I, I was passionate. I didn't sleep. You know, I was sleeping like two hours a night, you know. So it was one of these things where I was just like, all this life passion went into that for that semester, which meant I was doing a lot less studio. I mean, you know, I was doing studio too, but I slowed down a lot during that semester. Mm. Put a lot, you know, because there's only so much of you to go, you know, so. What year was I, this? That would have been 2004. Okay, okay. We started, so. Wow. Uh, yeah, yeah. You've done yeah. music your whole life, but so when you were a kid, wh- what were you, what did you get into? Did you get into punk rock? Like, can you, can you go back further? 
Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as a young child, uh, my very first memory of feeling passionate about music was one day I was, and this is a, I don't want to go into a sad story here, but my mom was uh, schizophrenic and she had had a, su a suicide attempt. And um, I didn't know exactly what had happened. I just knew she was in the hospital and my father had to go check on her. So he left my brother and I out in the van with some, with the radio on while he went inside and, and checked on her. And all of a sudden this song came on and it was the Beatles, I want to hold your hand. And I was listening to the lyrics and I'm like, man, that cute girl at school named Gina, I, I want to learn all these lyrics so I can go sing it to her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that, I, so I, I fell in love with that song. And it, at the time my English was still a little sketchy because I just moved back in kindergarten and this was first grade. So I didn't feel like I had, you know. So your first language was not English? No, it was Italian. Yeah. Okay, we we didn't get to that. We didn't. We skipped over that part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I was born in the U.S. Yeah. My parents were both Italian, so the house language was Italian. Mm -hmm. My mom's English was pretty poor, and so it was mainly just Italian at home. And then in school, we kept going back. Yeah, a in lot. school you started learning. That's yeah, my dad. My dad. My dad's first language was Spanish, and he learned English in school. But he was born in in the U.S. Uh, what's his heritage? Where is he from? Mexico, originally? Mexico. Mexico. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Do you speak Spanish too? Uh, I knew you were gonna ask that with all this language. <laughs> I don't really like. I <laughs> I had as much training as you, <laughs> which I I took uh, I took Spanish 101 actually. So I had more training than you, formal training. Um, but I, it just, it just never stuck. You know, it was like junior high, and I just wasn't into it. I, so I did the bare minimum. And my dad, he would speak. You know, I, I know, um, I know a lot of words, but I don't know how to put it all together. And so it's just so frustrating. Um, but not frustrating enough to where I've actually, <laughs> <laughs> you know, t done the work because it is hard work. I've over yeah. the years, it's like quitting smoking. You know, you, you quit smoking and you finally do it. But for me, I've tried to learn Spanish, and really, unless you. You, your mind is set on something, you're not going to do it. And I feel like music is the only thing that's, that's that's clicked for me, is my mind is set on writing songs. It's set on, on doing music. So I'll take but it. But as a singer <laughs> and a lyricist, yeah. you know, playing with words and having had that awareness, I'll bet that if the passion you know, mm. entered your soul, you would probably learn Spanish very quickly because musicality and, and language go together hand in hand. Um, yeah, just, yeah, and, and not having really, I'm, I'm always by myself doing it. I'm not having any like outside motivation, and so that that's hard for somebody. Yeah. And not everything I need that for, but eh, language is a tough one for me. <laughs> Anything that's super, super sit down and mentally think, that's that's. I mean, it's not as easy for for somebody like me as it is for maybe for you, right? Uh, but it's what you said. It's the passion. Like if yeah. you had this burning fire inside that you wanted to learn Spanish, then it would be easy. But, right. you know, I really think the passion makes things easy for us. You know, like if we're animated and just inspired and invigorated about something, it comes easier to us because mm. we're just so excited that we don't get discouraged by the failures and, you know, because everything takes a learning curve, you know. Even even your bass, I'm sure it took you a long time to get to the level you're at on on the bass, to the point where you've got a signature bass. By the way, gorgeous. Oh, thank <laughs> um, you. <laughs> you know, and I love I love the Music Man Stingray basses and that color that you chose. Ah, I'm I'm a sucker for the sky blue and even sky greenish kind of blends. Yeah, you know, like, yeah. Oh. Uh, there's a there's it. a bike I love called the Bianchi. It's a famous racing bike from Italy, and it's sort of like a light blue slash green mix, and it's a little more towards the green than your base, I think. But it's it's in that family of color. And so the first time I saw your base, I was like, oh my god, look at that base. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but to get to the level to deserve a signature base from a company like that, because that's a real legit. Um, bass maker probably one of the best basses ever made um you know the music band um to get to that level you obviously practiced and not everyone gets mm. there right you know and right because right. you had the passion for it so no i mean I, I i do think about that it's like we can we can all be hard on ourselves but 
it really is just whatever you put time into, you're going to get good at. And and sure, you may not still be the best in the world, and that's just the reality of life. But but um, I, I realize that, as, you know, finally in my life, I realize, okay, I'm not good at this because I haven't spent the time doing it. Like me on a pool table, you know, I'm terrible on the first game, but the second game, I'm starting to hit those balls in, you know, and, and starting <laughs> to get the geometry and, you know, but it's not something that just comes natural to me every time, because, you know, but a bass guitar, yeah, I, that's pretty natural. It feels good. It feels good to just put one on, but um, especially a Stingray. I mean, that's the, I can only imagine how many times I've, I've played a Sting, you know, my Stingrays in my lifetime, you know, thousands hundred a hundred thousand times i don't know but um interesting it's so great sounding bass i used one actually on a squirking album um oh you did another sunny afternoon okay. nice which i remember in fact it was just a funny thing i was cleaning up in the basement the other day and i saw an old cmj and i flip it open i'm like why did i save this cmj and i'm like it's because squirking was in the charts and like within one or two spaces was life in general by MXPX, and I'm like, this is hilarious timing that I run into this just now. <laughs> right. After I heard from Mike, you know, like, it's, like we were, you know, because I remember life in general being everywhere when we were touring on this another sunny afternoon, and I remember that too, you know. But it was kind of funny, and I played a Stingray on that one. So <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, I love it. Uh, you know, speaking of which, I know we're bouncing around a little bit, but so you got into music, you know, Beatles, all that. But how did you get into recording? Because that's a whole that's a whole different thing, you know, playing music versus producing, recording. How many records do you think you've made? Oh, my gosh. I, I <laughs> That's a great question. I think 300-ish. That's insane. That I is insane. <laughs> um, I mean, they're not all equally involved, you know. Like sure. Some of them I, I was more involved in than others. And honestly, a lot of the albums I was recording in the earlier 90s, you know, like, say, up through 95 a lot of those albums would like a band would come in and record non-stop from friday evening through sunday evening and then i mm -hmm. would either mix it with them or alone like the next weekend so that was like four or five days investment right but later on you know you get to the point where i'm re recording the rise against album the debut album and then we're spending like weeks and weeks mm -hmm. or anti-flag or um even uh, Screeching Weasel, uh, Television City Dream, we spent weeks doing, you know. So, obviously, like, the involvement level of some of those albums compared to some of the short ones isn't equal. But but still, 300 albums is a lot, you know. I'd say that yeah. it's around the right number. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to, it's hard to like even think about all those records individually right you can think of maybe certain things certain things stick out but um what was uh how did you start out did you start out on a tape machine was it was it adap machine what can you describe some of the technical difficulties yeah. that, that how weird yeah. it was at the beginning because kids these days they're never gonna oh, no. they're never gonna know <laughs> the pain and the struggle a, of of the old technology yeah you were there you know um mm -hmm. well the uh the first uh, album that I ever actually recorded in a serious way would have been my older band called Rat Till Grenadier, which was okay. basically what became Squirt Gun. It was three of us with a different singer. Um, it was my brother and I and Dan Lumley. Dan Lumley, who also was with me in Common Rider and Screeching Weasel and everything else. So the three of us with a different singer started that band, Rat Till Grenadier, in 83, I believe. 83, yeah. Um, and at that time, the very first album, we finally got recorded serious way. We recorded some local stuff, you know, in, in our basement on reel to reel, two track, you know, live yeah. through a mixer, two track. And then um, we um, ended up uh, playing a show with the Zero Boys, who at the time were um, really huge. And the singer was very well known as a producer. He was like one of the first big punk rock producers from the DIY American punk scene, um, Paul Mahern. He went on to produce, uh, well, he worked with Iggy Pop. He did stuff with the Lemonheads. He did stuff with uh, Blake Babies. And he also has produced a few John Mellencamp albums at this point in his right. life. So you know, he's done kind, all kinds of crazy stuff. But he produced the first Rat Tail and Deer album back in 88. And so I, I got a little bit of the experience of recording by being in the band. Um, and... So, so when I finally bought my own gear, which was like two and a half years later, two years later, I bought the same machine we just recorded that other album on, which was a, 
a one inch 16 track, which was, okay. you know, I guess you would call it prosumer. You know, it was definitely not like home recordist machine because that would have been too expensive for home recordists, but it wasn't like a really full on two inch 24 track, you know, analog deck of that kind. But that's how I started. So I had to splice tape and the punches were, I mean, it was a 15 inches per second. So your punches, you had to actually go one end to two end, uh, you know, on the... Right before. The yeah, before. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> there was an art to punching. Yeah, and punching a vocal mid-line was just not done, you know, because... No. I mean, you could try, but you probably butchered the line, you know. So it was one of those things that I, I managed to do when a singer wasn't pulling it off. I'm like... Back then, there was no pitch correction, right? Mm-hmm, so, mm-hmm. you know, you get a signal, I'm like, okay, you're sort of in the key of X here, which, you know, you've probably heard on a few of the Screeching Weasel records you listen to. There's some key of X going on. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, I did the yeah. best I could. Like, you know, like, you're sharp, you're flat. And I remember some singers, even then, like, I'd sit there and say, look, you know, I think you're a little sharp, you know, or mm-hmm. you mean to be doing this note and it's coming out like this. And they're like, what do you mean? I wrote the song. The way it's coming out of my mouth is the way it's supposed to be. That's how I wrote it. Like, <laughs> well, so I, it gets to That's the point genius. where, like, dude, you didn't invent music. You know, there's a scale, and you're singing a scale, and you're not quite hitting the note, you know? So it sounds a little funky, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so let's just try it again. <laughs> I wish I wouldn't even... I, I didn't even know that. That's how naive we were when we recorded our first two albums. So Poconatch in 1994, it came out. It came out in 1994, and then... Um, and then Teenage Politics in 1995, we just, I recorded, and every now and then if I like screwed up the words, they'd like start me, oh, we'll start you back at the, the next section. But that was it. It was like a pass through, and if, as long as you did it decently, there's no reason to go back and do it again. <laughs> so like, I think that was just, obviously, I probably caught the very end of not knowing that, but nowadays it's like, okay, let's go back and, and actually get that right. Uh, and I have a tendency as a singer to go a little sharp. Like, I think it's higher than it really is. And I have to remember that because it, in your mind, it feels normal sometimes, you know, and you're just like, you're just pushing a little too hard and you come back and you listen to it and you're like, it's sharp, but I didn't notice when I did it. So it's, it's a very weird thing for singers, I think, to go in and hear themselves all of a sudden. They're used to screaming in the garage, right? They're yeah. a punk band, ah, and then they come back and they listen to it, and most of the time it sounds great because it's like, oh, it's so much better than what we normally hear. Yeah. But you know, there's the instance of, oh, now we can actually hear what we're doing, and it is not good. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the ones who are aware and have an ear, because right, some people right. just think everything they do is gold. You know, it's like, um, but you know, the sharp thing is a very normal thing for a singer who's aware of singing because um, the thing that you know is it takes effort to bring the note up Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and relaxation and letting go it'll come down so the last thing you want to do is not give the effort it takes for a good performance that tends to push people sharp and they're one of the biggest fears is to be flat because that's what you hear people always say oh that guy's flat yeah yeah. so (laughs) you know no one wants to be flat so you're trying to make sure you're up to the note there's another factor when you're striking the guitar strings, even though you've tuned that A, you know, string perfectly, and now you're hitting it at the fifth fret and you're hitting a D, you know, between the way you're pushing down, if it isn't 100% straight down, and maybe it's a little twisted off, you're actually making it sharper. And then if you're hitting it hard, the attack of the string is tightening it, and so it's making it sharp. So there's a lot of things that go together. It, it all all builds up to a tendency towards sharpness. And I think that that's a way better one than tendency towards flatness because it shows you're not listening. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. That's good to know. I think people people dig that. Um, it's, it's funny, and I was talking about this a few episodes ago. I talked to a lot of producers lately, uh, but, which is great because that's what I love. But I kind of recently, and this kind of goes back to the, the thing I was talking about right at the top of the episode where... I learned something and then I'll forget it. Um, I, I recently realized, oh, I have to like work my voice out, kind of like a muscle, like going to the gym mm-hmm. in order to really be able to sing sustained high energy in the studio for a long time. Like, sure, you can get by with a show because it's usually an hour and a half tops for you know me. Um, and but you know, you're in the studio, you're singing full on 
over hours and over. hours. And this, you know, I was in the studio recently, and I was like, yeah, I gotta, I gotta start working this out earlier. Like it took, it, I would say it would take me a good two weeks of singing, try to sing just about every day to get my voice in the optimal position, um, because it, it really does sort of get in tune in a way. And out of, oh, yeah. tu- out of tune, out of, you know, when your car gets out of tune and you need a tune up, it's kind of like that, I think. Mm-hmm. No, I agree 100%. And I'm not even a singer, right? I do backing vocals. I sing harmonies for Squirt Gun, right? So it's not even real, not, not like the heavy I know what you mean. Yeah. singer yeah. thing. So, but I find that when I first start practicing again after we've not done shows for a long time, which tends to be my life, I tend to yeah. go a long time without and then I go out <laughs> and do it. And I'm like wow that's hard or even my bass lines because i write myself these stupid like there's a song called make it wreck that i wrote and it was on purpose um and it's the same thing i go through with that i have to warm up to it um to go on tour and play it but uh that song specifically reminds me of something funny i toured with common rider you know we Mm -hmm. did a couple different two different albums and every single time after the show someone would come up and talk to me and say oh man you guys were really good but you know, I'm used to hearing Jesse Michael's voice with a real good bass player. You know, because they're thinking Matt Freeman. You know? <laughs> right, right. But, I'm like, but man, what? Common Rider's like got a different groove. We were a little slower. It's a little bit mellower. It's not. If I went on it, it would make no sense when the beat's like do do da do do. You know, it doesn't make yeah. any sense. You know, it's not the same. It's not Maxwell Murder, and uh, so. I guess I was like so sick of hearing that every night that when I came back to do the next Squirkin album, after having been out with that Common Rider tour, I'm like, all right, I'm going to write the most idiotic, stupid, crazy, unplayable bass line I can even manage to think of. And so I wrote a solo for that song, Make It Wreck. <laughs> and it's it's really fast and crazy, but it was at the very limits of my ability, right? Mm-hmm. And back when I was playing constantly. So now, like, when it's time for us to play a show, and of course now it's become one of our more popular songs with Squirkin, so we have to play it. I'm like, <laughs> so like, oh my God, I can't play my own song anymore. And I sit there and my fingers are hurting, trying to practice it and get it in line. And, and I find the same thing true with the vocals. We wrote these higher harmonies that I sing. And my voice isn't naturally as high as I'm singing. So I'm like up there trying to go, nah, nah, nah. I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> how am I going to hit this note? And then magically after a couple of weeks of practicing, all of a sudden the notes start to come back to mm-hmm. me, you know, but, and that's me singing parts of songs, not like a full lead like you do. You yeah. Know, so I can't imagine. <laughs> yeah. It's just making those connections back. You're like, oh, if I do this, this happens. And then like realizing that, you know, it's, it's something that. Like I said, like somebody like you, you probably just get that naturally. But for me, it's always been that with music. Like when I taught myself how to play chords when I was a kid, and I did take bass lessons. I took, um, I took like you know a couple months of bass lessons. So I learned a blues scale and a arped, you know, a major arpeggio and a minor scale and things like that. You know, like the twelve bar blues thing, walking. Um, and and I learned who Primus and Red Hot Chili Peppers were, so. <laughs> but but you know I taught myself how to do you know when I went to guitar, uh, I was just like I'm gonna get a chord book and learn some chords, and it wasn't until like I don't know I think six months in I was playing guitar and I was doing these chords and I realized, oh my God, a bar chord is like an open chord like an open E or an open A and it just moves up the neck, and it's obvious but no one ever told me that and i didn't make that mm-hmm. connection until six months later down the road and then after that it was like boom skyrocket connection you know successful um and, and that's the thing is like if but at the same time i wonder if somebody would have told me that early on would i have gotten it the same way maybe not you know because it's like i don't understand what you mean by that because i've told my daughter that she's learning to play guitar and i'm like look this is the e you can just do the same thing and she can't really do bar chords she can't do like power chords yet she can mainly just do like open chords but it doesn't click for her yet well you know there's something to be said like i i feel like i got the same snow job basically learning music i started on the saxophone and learned bass later but First of all, with a single, with an instrument that's monophonic, right? You can only play one note at a time on a saxophone. Mm-hmm. Um, 
you don't learn the relationship of notes to each other like you would on a guitar or a piano where you can play polyphonic chords. So that's one thing. But another one is, I, they would tell me, learn this scale, you know, in, in school. I'm like, okay, so what? why does it matter? Like, you're going to give me sheet music to play exactly this, whatever you want me to play for the songs that we play. So why do I need to know a scale? I don't get it, you know? And it did not click until years later for me that, oh, that G scale can be played over any G chord progression that you've got. So if someone's playing a G chord and you're playing the scale, it'll sound good on it. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, and it took me a long time too because no one told me, you know, just like you said, no yeah. one told you. Yeah. You know, another cool thing about music since we're on it, like the relative minor thing. So major to like a step and a half down minor. Mm -hmm. and, and that, I mean, that alone really made my whole musical songwriting change completely and you can probably listen to our first album and then our second album and you're like oh my god it's like there's minors everywhere and there's there's a seventh too you know, seventh maybe was a couple years later than than that even but it is just funny like listening back thinking back not listening really but uh yeah it's it, there's a progression of oh i learned this i, I think you know um an obvious one for a lot of people is Elvis Costello was a huge influence on our ever passing moment album. So songs like responsibility. And, uh, I mean, that's like, it's not a complete rip off of, of pump it up, but it's got a similar vibe. You know, it's like, that's that, you know, if you put a keyboard or a, or an organ on that, it would like totally fit. But I, I feel like, like I made a similar kind of, it just popped into my mind too. Of course, it was, it was invented. Who knows when, you know? But the relative minor, like, mm -hmm. wow. So the G scale notes on the major scale are exactly the same notes as the E minor, and if I just play them in a different order, they'll sound right. Like so, like wow. So I can make this major scale melody sound like a pop song on the chorus, but I can play the minor progression and, and it sounds like a minor on the verse. This is awesome. Of course, you know, who does that all the time is Alkaline Trio, right? You know, they do it all the time. Mm. And um, it, like every song basically of, of Matt Skiba's was, was something in that ra range, which I, I love. I mean, he's a friend of mine too, and I've recorded him in the studio and he did backing vocals on, on our albums and everything. But it's funny because I became a fan of alkaline trio even though the way i met him was that he was like hey mask can you get me into the screeching weasel show <laughs> <That's how laughs> I met you know? so i met him because he was our fan but then i became a super fan of, of his you know and, yeah now and, and i remember the next time i saw him after i discovered the music i'm like holy crap you know skiba your songs are awesome you know and it taught me a new way to look at songs and i ended up changing my songwriting because of him you know i'm like and this was a little kid that used to come and watch us play it's it's kind of fun this circularity of music and how it doesn't really matter who's older or who's younger who came first because you can still learn from the youngest ones you know <laughs> so absolutely well you know they just take something that's been done but they do it in their way and it's like new and you're like oh yeah duh you know and i've talked about this a lot with songwriting it's like the fact that you can take a one four five progression and turn it into a thousand songs that sound different from each other you know yep. different beats different obviously different scales different you know notes and chords and stuff but uh keys sorry that's probably the correct thing to say um yeah it, it blows my mind yet it still happens constantly and and for me as a songwriter going am i really using the same progression again and I, you know but this is what it needs to be because i come up with a hook a lot of times just in my head and i'll you know i'll sing it into my phone and then i'll come back to it with the guitar and i'll figure out what that is and sure enough, it's like a, something that I've used a million times. Not always a one four five, but you just got to go with it. I mean, it's either good or it's not. It doesn't matter if it's the same chords. And whether it's a melodic minor or a major scale, there's seven notes, you know, because the octave is the yeah. eighth. You know, it's already the same as the first one. So you've got seven notes, and and that's basically what all you know. And of course, obviously, you could break, you know break scale and add a different and then do a complete change of scale in different parts of the song you can get crazy and play every single note you know but still you're talking 11 notes mm -hmm. there's 11 notes if you include every half step between one and where you start hitting the octaves again it's, it's still limited you know it's like so my father was an artist i don't know if you could see this drawing behind us it's a full, full mural yeah um 
he did that, but he was a pioneer of computer art. He's got uh, 14 pieces in the Smithsonian. Um, there's a book out about his computer art and, and everything else as well. Um, he, he passed away several years ago, but but he was a very creative man. And he also had two PhDs in um, the sciences, and he was working on one in physics for fun. He had civil engineering, mechanical engineering, and he was working on physics for fun when physics he passed. Physics for fun. PhDs, Amazing. you know? Yeah. So the guy was... Anyway, wow. he what, what was your father's name? name? Aldo, A L D O. Aldo, beautiful, Aldo beautiful name. Yeah, it's so cool. And he awesome. was super supportive of the punk. In fact, uh, how to make enemies and irritate people. That album was recorded while my father was in the final stages of his life. He had brain cancer, and it was dedicated to my dad. It was mm. On the back, it's like dedicated to the memory of Aldo Giorgini, a great man. And then uh, Larry Livermore's last column for Maximum Rock and Roll was dedicated to my father and. Toxic Reasons, like legendary punk band I grew up listening to, um, they dedicated their final album to my dad as well. So he had, mm. he was like really involved in punk, but he was like the least punk dude in the world as far as like if you looked at him, you know, yeah. he'd wear cowboy boots and polyester pants and <laughs> just, you know, and he'd wear a shirt and tie, but he'd put a punk shirt over it and he'd go teach his classes at the university. You know, it's like he was a, a but he would say creatively, he said he would say mass, 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 you're trying to do too much. You know, put yourself a parameter. You're like punk rock is a parameter. There's a very limited range of music you can do that's called punk in a strict sense. Um, you know, you could call, and he would say like for the Ramones, and this is my dad talking by the way in the 80s, right? Saying like the Ramones would be an example of a real legitimate strict punk band. Because they gave themselves four lines and made a square and said this, whatever fits in this box is punk. To be as creative as you could possibly be while you're still inside that box, that's writing songs and being creative. Now, if you want to break the rules and do something completely outside of the parameters of punk, first you got to know the rules of punk before you can break them and have it mean anything. <laughs> <laughs> the guy was so cool. You know? That is that's that's very insightful. That's so true. That's so true. He's that's like, that's interesting. Yeah, you know what you know what makes something punk what makes some you know whatever it is you're trying to do what makes it that and and am i doing that am i am i successful at doing that a lot of people don't really ask themselves those those questions they're just kind of like busy you know they're just busy yeah. busy busy doing everything and I, and i find us musicians especially in the modern age um we realize we have to do socials we have to do you know, we have to make the album, we have to promote the album, we have to promote the tour, we have to do the tour, you know, and and if you don't realize you have to do that, then you're farther behind than I realized, than you realized. But, uh, but you know, you have to do so many things, it almost seems impossible, right? You know, but giving yourself a plan, and an outline, something to like, so you don't go completely crazy, that's, that's, that's smart. That helps me. Just just having this conversation honestly helps me. Well, yeah, I, I love uh, thinking about this stuff because some you get breakthroughs, right? Yeah, and yeah. Even if the idea may be latent somewhere in the back of your mind, like it's present, you've experienced it, but you haven't verbalized it, sometimes the moment of having the conversation and trying to explain that feeling or that idea or that groove that you've got going on in your mind makes it obvious to you. You may have not even been aware and now you've laid it bare to yourself while you were trying to explain it to someone else and you know, it's just yeah, yeah consciousness is really wacky that way and it's 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 fun i i was thinking just a moment ago like uh all I, i've heard several episodes of your podcast I and mean, i don't know the number but i know you've got hundreds right so um, yeah. but i've heard several and and lots of my buddies that have been on there was actually a moment about a year and a half ago where um, we started a project, this little project band. It never finished. And maybe I can try to kickstart it again in the future now that I'm thinking of it. Go back and contact everybody. Yeah. But it was Mike Kennerty, uh, me, Stefan Egerton, and Chris DeMakes. And um, we had a song written. Mike wrote the song. He did a demo of it and sent it. And Stefan was going to drum. Yeah, um, that makes sense. Great drum. I was going to say, drummer. the only one there, I think, is Stefan on the drums. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So he was going to be the drummer. And um, and it got in his hands. And then, you know, you know how life is. His computer crashed. He needed to buy a new computer for his Pro Tools. And yeah, then tours started happening. And blah, 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 blah. And it, so it's never... But the song was written. Like, the yeah. first song 
and Mike even had, I think, four or five other, you know, beginnings of songs like that were intended to actually be the beginning of it. But uh, it's kind of floundered. But it's funny because every one of us has been with you on this show. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, it's it would have been a cool thing, I think. But well, now that you've been on, then it can get finished and then finally yeah well, then we'll do it again <laughs> <laughs> it's your fault huh? yeah you were not. my fault again well uh you know it's funny it's like uh, with this podcast honestly i i i do talk to people that i've never talked to before i would say you would be one of them but there are almost always some con- connections in the scene um now even if it's somebody that's just an, an author and not really connected to the punk scene, but they're a punk fan, you know, and they they love punk music or whatever. It usually happens, but uh, you know, I just I just been having a good time with this thing because it's just I can talk to friends, have people on, get catch up, talk about recording, things I love to talk about, which is recording, the future of recording, the past, fun stories, you know. It's uh, and then just you know, of course, you know, if we if a volcano or an earthquake happens tomorrow and this is, this all goes away, fine. But we had the conversations. We got I got to know more people in this life. And for me, as, a, as an artist that does most of my work alone, by myself, um, whether it's even just songwriting and rec- recording, everything else I do uh, most of the days is alone until I'm doing like a podcast with talking to somebody or when we're actually re- practicing or recording with the band. So I, this kind of forces me in a way, forces, I don't, I don't want to say force because I do it willingly, but it's my college, it's my education. I never went to, I never got past high school basically. And so like it's always been touring and the road and, and so in a lot of ways I feel stunted, you know, as like some adults are, are more mature than others. I wouldn't say I'm immature, but, uh, but you know, there's a lot to learn constantly and, uh, I just appreciate but, it. So appreciate you know, with your time. a PhD, there's a lot to learn. You know, like I, I, there's so many things I don't know. Like I know a lot about one little thing, right? So, you know, but then there's so much out there that I don't know. And I, and I do feel like, uh, you know, knowledge is not something that can only be quantified with formal education. Um, you know, you were mentioning, you know, you, you um, stopped studying formally at high school, but how much have you learned since then? You've probably learned sure. more since then than you learned up until then. Um, and, and another friend of mine who, um, the teen idols, you know, we talked about them earlier, yeah. uh, Philip Hill, he, he dropped out of high school and went back and got a GED later and never went to university, but I've never seen a mind that is more brilliant in capturing musical ideas. You know, when I say that, I mean, like he hears like the beginning of a melody, he immediately hears an end of it, you mm-hmm. know, and mm-hmm. he hears a, a melody line, he knows a harmony, and he can come up with a second harmony on the spot. Like, there's certain gifts he has, um, and he's really good at learning technical things, like in a studio as an engineering um, person goes. You know, he, was, he engineered a lot of albums I worked on, he was one of my assistants, and he's just brilliant, you know. So, I don't know, I, like, I, I wouldn't... I, I'm not disparaging education because obviously sure. I got a PhD, but at the same time, I'm like, there's plenty of PhDs that I know and I can remember, like in my mind, <laughs> that I'm like, how'd they get through this? They were just like nose of the grindstone working, but they weren't necessarily very brilliant. Right, you know? right, right. <laughs> like, you could see brilliance in all kinds of people who haven't had um, advanced educations. And it's just, but, you know, and, I say that, you know, and I'm, I'm an, I was an educator. I was a professor, you know, so, mm-hmm. and I've taught in Spanish, Italian, and theater <laughs> at the university level. But still I say, you know, what qualified me to teach theater? It was the music composition program and, and audio production. Um, I never studied that. I learned that on my own. I learned how to engineer on my own, and yet I'm teaching at Purdue University to graduate students working on their terminal degree. And it's not called a PhD in that area, it's called an MFA, but it's the same as a PhD for the arts. And they can go and become university professors after they get out of that class. And I'm teaching them audio production, right? Did I (laughs) study it? Right. I learned it on my own. That's right, that's right. Does that make me less legitimate? No, I don't think so. You know, and it's it's one of those things where I feel like your case is the same, you know? You say, hey, I stopped studying after high school but man did you stop learning not at all <laughs> no i mean it, it's it's amazing that 
all the things I learned, you know, throughout my life. But one of the things, uh, thinking about language, you know, and you probably can attest to this, but you, when you're immersed in a country, you know, for a while, you pick up words and, you, you know, if you want to, you, you know, and I feel like that's honestly been the best is whenever I go to Mexico, whenever I go to like Latin speaking countries, I'll come back speaking sentences, you know, but then it fades, it fades fairly quickly if you don't keep with it. And it's even the same with like Russian and German and, and, you know, I wouldn't say I know as much of that stuff, but I remember the key words like spicy, you know, thank you uh, <laughs> yeah. in, in Russian, you know, things like that. So that's just from touring too. And, and being a, uh, not just touring, but being a singer and playing shows to playing shows for other people that are non-English speaking. You can't do your normal spiel. I mean, sure, you can try it, but then they're just going to stare at you. Or uh, you got to keep things different, keep things more broad. And then I always like to to have, like, um, especially in Japan, I had, like, a list of, of phrases in J- Japanese. And I would phonetically write it out, and it would be, like, next to my set list. Hey, you know, and... Come by, come by, or whatever it is, you know. <laughs> Cheers. Um, <laughs> you know, it really, that was really fun. Like, I really enjoyed that. But to take it further than that is where the fun stops and the real work begins of, okay, actually learning the language. But I can just Again, see, though, yeah, immersion. It, it, when you've got the passion, it's easier, you know, yeah. like, and you were interested in learning those few words to get mm-hmm. going and, and have something to say between songs. And and you had enough passion for that, and that was good. But to l- sit down and like have a long conversation about the weather, it might be a different story. You know? Does it make so, Does it kind of make your brain hurt like, when you're trying to think <laughs> of in a different language? I think at the beginning it can be tough. Yeah. Um, for me, uh, when I first started <laughs> learning Spanish, it was tough. Like people now think, what? I mean, how was that tough? You know, you did it in six weeks, but um, and you were speaking in a college class. But but it wasn't easy, and I did have a lot of times where the Italian word wanted to hop in or a French word wanted mm. to hop in because, you know, they're Latin languages and they have common roots. But like, for example, always siempre in Spanish and it's siempre in Italian. It's not far off, right? Mm. So when you're trying to speak fast in a new language, and to you it's always been siempre and all of a sudden you've got to remember it's siempre. Maybe it'll come out right, maybe it won't. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, it takes a while to get in the groove. But now I'm pretty good at going back and forth between Italian and, and, and Spanish without getting tripped over myself. But they used to occupy a similar place in my brain, and that was it was tougher then. I'm gonna ask you a question. I don't think I've ever asked this on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Since we're in academics, how's your math game? Well, you know, it's funny. Um, my father was absolutely brilliant with math, and he called math beautiful and he said math is art art is math and that's how well I remember he was he did a lot of computer art so obviously for him and this is back when you couldn't just say make a square you had to type a long formula for something to happen on the computer it was like a different era it was in the 70s and mm-hmm. um so i've always connected the idea of numbers with beauty and of course 440 cycles per second is a right mm-hmm. you know and you double that to 880, it's still an A at a, one octave higher. And, and like there's math in, in, in music too. So I, I, um, I've never loved math by itself, but I've always been really good at adding and subtracting and multiplying and things like that. You know, I mean, better than most of my friends have been, um, but not to the point my dad. Like with my dad, I remember I'd say, Dad, what's the square root of 372? And he'd sit there and go, well, you know, and he'd start putting it together in his mind. And start telling you the digits one at a time. Yeah. <laughs> like, what? There's one. <laughs> there's two. <laughs> like, uh, square roots, man. That's getting crazy, you know, because the number multiplied by itself, it gives you that result. I'm like, oh, that gets a little crazy, you know. It's fine yeah. when it's 16 and you say four times four is 16. But when you start getting into crazy numbers, oh, my God, you know, how do you do that? <laughs> I mean, yeah, that reminds me of my son walking around with – um a Rubik's Cube and he's like dad the Rubik's Cube it's a this is a three by and I'm like are they calling it three by now because there's different size cubes there's three by four by and it changes the but I never learned how to do a Rubik's Cube but I know it's something you you can learn or you can figure out if you're just a genius but he's not necessarily uh, he doesn't know how to do it yet but he's interested in it I'm like I'm kind of just like do I 
direct him towards like a video or do I just wait and see what happens? So I'm just waiting to see what happens. <laughs> To see My what he brother does. <laughs> was one of those obsessive guys that ended up getting a book on how to solve the Rubik's Cube and he learned the method and so he mm -hmm. was really fast. And he was my baby brother and I was like, fine, you do that. I'm going to go on a date. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> <That's cool. laughs> you know, I was 16, he was 14, so we had different interests and I'm like, yeah, you know, that's cool. Rubik's Cube's fine, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, He's I, five. I my son's cool. five, but. Yeah, well, that's, yeah, that's very young. Yeah. Yeah. Super young. But they, but yeah. they watch these videos these days, and like my son in particular, he likes to watch educational videos. So he's always coming out with these like trivia quotes, and you're just like, what? Yeah, okay. <laughs> my son is three and a half, and there's like some commercial that he watches a lot of YouTube, you know, and mm -hmm. there was some commercial that comes on locally for an, a technical institute, and they have this long quote about this guy. I can't remember his name now, but like Joseph uh, Williams is excellent at working with computer algorithms and it, it has this long quote and so my son will just it'll start and he'll say joseph williams is excellent at working with computer algorithms and he's three and a half and i'm looking at him going what yeah <laughs> <laughs> how do you fit that in your brain you know that's crazy you're still trying to figure out how to poop on the potty <laughs> yeah i mean that's that just goes that just goes to it too because like learn looking at kids and seeing how smart they are and how they retain things that i just forget trivial things things that you're like okay that's an everyday thing though it's a big deal and they 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 remember but back to the thing again you know me learning something and then forgetting like i pretty sure i knew mike dirt played on that screeching weasel record yeah yeah played bass but then i was reading about it again on the uh Sonic Iguana website and going, wait, really? You know, like as if it, yeah. like as if I didn't know. So it's like that yeah. kind of stuff happens. But I think it just also is one, you know, we're just, we've lived so much life. There's so much going on and the internet, like, are we really meant to know all these things about <laughs> everything happening all over the world? Because back when we were kind of like just getting into music, it was just, all right, this chord, how do we do this chord? And then, oh, what's a, a relative minor? Cool, and then my mind's blown. Like, I don't know, the yeah, internet. you guessed it on for Screeching Weasel. Josie Cotton was also on that one, wasn't she? Was it the same album? How to Win Friends and Irritate People? Was that the I one? mean, the one, that, the one that you were on. Um, oh, 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 the one that I was on. That was uh, the last Screeching Weasel record. Um, the Freaks of Atavism. Yeah, or like Freaks that. of Atavism. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think one of the other guest stars was Josie Cotton, and she wrote the song Johnny Are You Queer that Screeching Weasel covered on the uh, How to Make Enemies and Irritate People album. Okay. So it kind of, there's a little circle there. Oh. Um, but Mike and I, um, um, I mean, I'm talking about Mike Durant now. Uh, yep. Mike Durant and I, when we were working on that album, it was just the two bass players down in the basement. You know, he was recording his bass lines because he recorded them after the drums and and uh, guitar were done. He came in and did his parts. He played through my amp and he brought his own bass. And then he would take you like, I, I need a break, man. And so we're like, let's go for a walk. And we'd go out and I remember we would walk around the city and we were talking about how awesome Josie Cotton was, how cute she is. And, 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 and I think if I remember right, when Justin was on your show, he brought up the movie Valley Girl with Nicolas Cage. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, in that movie, um, Josie Cotton appears on stage at a dance that Nicolas Cage goes to, like this club where there's like a whole dancing going on. Nic um, Josie Cotton was on stage. And so we were talking wow. about that movie, Mike Dirt and I, walking around the town. And then here we are years later, the same album you sung on, Josie Cotton is a guest star on the album. And she had, you know, it's like just how, how funny like uh, life can spin around. Here's another little weird thing. Um, uh, Mike Durnt knew that I was in Rome about two and a half years ago. I was uh, doing some linguistic work over there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, um, in that, uh, he knew that I was there. And his daughter went with a student group from her university to Rome. And she was getting a little tired of hanging out with the same group of students over and every, you know, every, every day and blah, blah, blah. He goes, Mass, do you think it'd be okay to you know, just meet up with her and you guys can hang out? And I'm like, yeah, but I'm an old dude. And she's like pretty 22 year old girl hanging out with college students you know sure if she wants to i'll show her around 
but we just hit it off and we ended up hanging out three evenings going out to dinner to different restaurants around the city and i took her to the spanish steps and she's like i was here with my tour group they didn't tell me that part and i'm like well i'm a nerd so i could tell you all. yeah yeah <laughs> so we had a lot of fun and it's it was crazy to think that when mike and i did that um that album and doing those bass lines he had not even yet met the person who was going to be the mother of estelle you know the daughter that i'm hanging out with and walking around the city with all these years later wow like you know life can be funny and circular and uh, and it's cool because you look at all the connections between us we talked about all these guests you've had on like but um josh caterer the smoking popes they did yeah. a big album with me yeah you know and yeah uh, and Mike Fellamley, who was in the band as the drummer, played in Squirt Gun um, for a year and a half. We did a few nice. tours together. And I need to have him on because he's I've been I've done his podcast or kind of podcast he has. Yeah. Yeah. yeah he's a great guy. And yeah. He was in my band with me, and of course I recorded Smoking Pokes. But then he also had a record label, and two bands on his label were, worked with me. So that it's just funny how. Things just keep kind of flowing in and out of each other over the years, and uh, there's all these intersections. And and you had Dan Vapid on um, recently. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah. Dan's great. Dan and I played. Well, I recorded the Methadones. I recorded the Mokes. I recorded the Queers. I recorded um, uh, Screeching Weasel. All these bands that he was mm-hmm. in. Riverdale's, you know. And on top of it, we were in the Mokes together for a little bit. And then we played shows together in Screeching Weasel. And then we played shows. To, you know, like it, there's so many family-like connections between all these people in the punk scene. And um, that's why, even though this may be the first time we've had a long chat, I kind of feel like I know you. I've, I've heard your voice a lot on the podcast. I've, you know, you talking with all my best buddies. You know, yeah, so I'm yeah. Like, yeah, like, he's one of the crew. <laughs> Dude, I'm so glad we did, too, because, I mean, you're great. And it's amazing to hear about all your stuff, the, the TED Talk. Everybody go listen to TED Talk. Just, just you know, I, it makes me proud that, somebody from punk rock is doing what you're doing so can we at least talk a little bit about what you've been up to lately so what you've been spending a lot of time doing yeah um and i'll hit music first real quick and then i'll yeah. go to the academic stuff um mm-hmm. uh with music um i've been mainly mixing and mastering um, and less and less producing because i've been very heavily involved in uh, linguistic work that pulls me away mm-hmm. sometimes sort of last minute and unexpectedly I'm I have to work on some project or other that needs me um, so um, I've pulled away a little bit from the production part of it because you know that's oftentimes two months sitting in one studio room 12 hours a day and that's just yeah not, yeah not conducive to having much of a life outside of it right but I um, did produce a full album that I'm almost done with. I'm on the last stages for Kepi Gooley from the Groovy Ghoulies. Yeah, Kepi, I know Kepi. He's great. Yeah. And uh, the drummer in that is Ara Babajian, who's in the Slackers. He's the drummer for the Slackers, the, the ska, reggae kind mm-hmm, of band. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But he was also in Leftover Crack and Star Fucking Hipsters before that. Um, and then um, the bassist is uh, B-Face, who used to be in the Queers. Okay. Okay, I don't know B-Face, but I, don't, I know of him, definitely. Great guy. Um, awesome, awesome. So I produced that one, and I'm working on the final stages. And then another album I'm really, really excited about is uh, the new Suzy Moon album. Um, okay. I've, seen, I've been seeing her name everywhere lately, by the way. Oh, she, she, is a, she is destined to be a star. Um, first of all, she's just, she's got a really cool kind of, sort of like reincarnation of Joan Jett look and voice but beyond that she's got i mean you know joan jett had a great presence but Mm -hmm. but i mean Susie's presence on stage she's like she takes it another level up and she writes all her own songs too so you know joan jett's famous for all the covers she did you know crimson Mm -hmm. clover i love rock and roll those are all covers Mm -hmm. well Susie writes all her own songs and so it's it's pretty darn cool to see what she's got going on. I know she's going to be out near you with uh, Teenage Bottle Rocket soon. Oh, okay. For them, so. I wonder if she's going to... She's playing Bremerton, I think. Yeah, she's playing Bremerton. I guess she mentioned that because I, I told her I was going to talk to you. I, I will and go to the show. She said, I'm playing Bremerton. Isn't that near where they're from? And I'm like, yeah, I think Mike's from Bremerton. So. Yeah, yeah. It's like four miles or less than four miles from where I live, where the show is, so. 
Perfect. Uh, All right. That's amazing. She's fantastic. Um, not only as a musician, but as a person. I just think of the world of her and the band she assembled. Um, her uh, boyfriend, like live in boyfriend, serious uh, boyfriend, Drew, is the guitar player. Uh, fantastic guitar player. Um, really lots of cool classical punk kind of influences, you know, like not just limited, but very wide ranging. And then a uh, bassist named Patty, super rocking, great drummer. I mean, they're drummer Sean. They're, they're all really, really good. I think you'll you'll dig them. Um, then I've been mastering only on another album, um, but I really also love it. Uh, Haley and the Crushers. Um, and uh, talk about Full Circle again. Haley and the Crushers is signed to Kitten Robot Records, which is owned by Josie Cotton. Really? Okay. Same guy okay. who's in the Nicolas Cage uh, Valley Girl yeah. movie and, and who wrote Johnny Are You Queer that Screeching Weasel covered in 94. <laughs> you know, like it just, it's funny how the, the scene yeah, can be. Yeah. So it's... I'm mastering that album, but it's been a very involved mastering because they've mixed them all separately. And um, the producer that produced the actual tracks, Paul Rosler, is like, you might um, not be, know that you know him, but he did tons of the early punk recording going back to the late 70s in L.A. His sister, Kira, was probably the most famous bass player from Black, Black Flag. Black Flag, yeah. Kira. Okay, uh, that's the connection. So I didn't ha I didn't know that. That's cool. It's just cool as heck. Yeah. Um, I just finished uh, a few weeks ago, I finished the new Amberetta, and... I'm really excited about that one too. They recorded it all themselves and they sent it to me to master. Um, they did a fantastic job tracking it too. I mean, it really uh, sounds great, but the songwriting too uh, reminds me of like the alarm, which I loved when I was a kid. You know, the really anthemic, like, yeah. sort of power pop punk, you know, songs like 86 Guns and The Stand and all that. And I feel like Amberetta has sort of grabbed part of that and brought it in a little you know obviously it's more modern because we're talking many years later you know but but they've got some of that same like full-on anthem thing going on so i'm really excited about the music i'm doing like working on lately someday a new squirt gun's coming you know that's nice yes door. good good can't wait uh, so is it still sonic iguana when you do mixing mastering stuff yeah i call it uh, mixed at sonic iguana mastered at sonic cool. iguana um and i've i've had the same location like i was uh in one location where we did um, Wiggle, Screeching Weasel Wiggle, and we did the Ramones cover album, and we did um, some pieces of the first Squirt Gun album there. And then I moved to another location in downtown Lafayette for three years, where I did Love Songs for the Retarded by the Queers, Anthem for New Tomorrow um, by um, uh, Screeching Weasel. I did um, uh, the, uh, sizzle, uh, the Smugglers selling the Sizzle, for example, and the rest of the first Squirt Gun album. And then I moved to another location, which was a little further out of town. It's still in Lafayette, but outside of the downtown. And I was there for many, many years. But now I'm getting ready to make another huge move. And oh, no really? one has nice. heard this before. This is new for your podcast. All right. Um, but I'm going to be moving to Rome. And, Whoa. Yeah, Rome, Italy. And, Rome. Um, um, Permanently? I'm going to continue. Well, no, it's going to be for a few years. A few years, okay. So, okay. Um, I'd say three is the, the target. So wild, um, wild. Yeah, three years, and I'll be uh, I'll still be doing mixing and mastering for sure. But I'm probably going to have more and more limited production. But there's a couple. Mm -hmm. of, like I know Susie said, Mass. What if I want to come and record an album in Rome? Would you produce me out there? I'm like, it's Susie. How do I say no? You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> of course, yeah, yeah. You know, of course. <laughs> you know. Um, but in general, I'm going to be doing mainly mixing and mastering, or sometimes I'll help bands like in a pre-production way where bands will send me a song and say, I can't think of what to do with this. This is my song. Can you think of something? And I'm like, yeah, like let's change up this bridge or, or how about this harmony here or do a counter melody um, here, you know, and maybe I'll write a little guitar melody for them. I can't play guitar very well, but you know, I, enough. Like yeah. I'm a bass player. I can do single notes. You know? <laughs> <laughs> a little single note lead or, or or come up with a backing vocal or something like that or maybe rearrange the song or suggest mm -hmm. like a chord drop like hey instead of just sticking to the root three like i know you're doing you know g c d g c d on the verse how about like in the middle of the second verse you just all of a sudden drop and go ga -ga, with the drums hitting it and you hit the e minor you know just to yeah kind of shake things up and then go back to your same pattern you're like what <laughs> but to me that stuff sounds natural because you know i've been recording forever and so 
I like doing that kind of, I don't know what you'd call it, partial production or helping with composition. Yeah, it's it's like um, arrangement. Yeah, production, yeah. arrangement, producing the arrangement and, and yeah, being that fifth member of the band or whatever member of the band, yeah. extra member. And I would never take a songwriting credit for that. It's just like a... Mm -hmm. It's like, I, I would call it like, you know, whatever they want to call me, you know, they say whatever credit you want to give me, give it to me, but don't call me a songwriter. That's more that. producer. I think, I think that's producer. Yeah. 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 Uh, I mean, you mentioned love songs for the retarded. That is one of my favorite punk records. Like it's probably influenced a lot of my songwriting without me realizing it just because I just love those songs, man. Like it's not a perfect record. It's probably, it was recorded pretty quickly, you know, but like to me, it, I never, that was never, I never noticed that, you know, it was just always about the songs and the energy. And so I thought that to me, like, and the fact that it could be so sugary too, in time, at times, you know, some of those <laughs> songs are just like, that's a, like a, basically like a bebop 50 song with some distorted guitars, but I like it. That's what I like. You know, I grew up listening to the Beatles like you, yeah. uh, and just songs, you know, as for me, it was always about the song hitting me in the right way and so that album man i'm a huge fan well and you know joe uh i mean i i mean i know that he's he's done plenty of tours where he mainly stuck to the you know really really simple ones that are like really quick punk rock attitude you know testing like this yeah um <laughs> but the truth is he can write beautiful songs like you can tell that he listened to the beach boys at times mm -hmm. just oh yeah oh yeah it. like don't back down album you just it's mm -hmm. just covered with a lot of that influence and he has first of all he's a good singer second of all he's a good guitarist and and then the songwriting just comes natural to him through the music and melodies that he writes and and i think on that album even though it's mainly a bratty snotty you know kind of punk album like you said deborah jean is a straight up 60s style love song love it so good you know yeah so no you're right that's got some really cool stuff on it and it was recorded like in day and a half <laughs> yeah yeah i know i'm sure that's the thing is like we try these days sometimes we just try too hard and it just becomes weird sounding you know and it's just a lot of the records you hear you're just like i know they tried hard but they also didn't try hard because they used all the tools that make everything perfect but they didn't mm -hmm. use the you know they didn't i get it it's hard to make a record it is hard yeah. to make a, a good record yes it and, is. and and good doesn't mean perfect i mean there's no. that that weird ether between sloppy and punk rock and then too perfect in between is always where we're trying i'm trying to land as an artist but that's a struggle i mean that's that's part of why i think it's so fun because it's doable it's it's not like we're trying to be perfect huh. i remember that yeah. I, there was a little period of time where i lived with uh you wouldn't believe, I, mean, I live in lafayette indiana right i'm in the middle yeah. of cornfields right but there was a short period of time where I had two roommates. One was Chris Bauermeister, better known as the bassist of Jawbreaker. The other one was Jesse Michaels from Operation Ivy. And of course, I was in Screeching Weasel at this time. And so we've got this little house in Indiana with a guy from Screeching Weasel, a guy from Operation Ivy, and a guy from <laughs> Jawbreaker living. And I remember I was going to the studio to record. And one day, like, you know, we were talking about music and everything else. And I go to the studio and I'm recording this band. And the singer was from, or the drummer was from Italy. And in the middle of a drums take, he's sitting there doing boom, chicka, boom, boom, chicka, boom, chicka, boom, something like that. All of a sudden, he drops his stick. So it's like boom, chicka, boom, chicka. And then he kind of loses the beat a little because he bends over to pick up that stick from the floor. And then he keeps playing. And then he gets done. I'm like, hey, look, the form sounded good. I like the way everybody played together. Um, but the most important thing is getting the drums down on the live take. And we can redo everybody else if we need to. Um, and we, so we need, we're going to need to redo this. And he's like... Why? And I'm like, well, because he dropped the stick. And he goes, no, you do not understand. You want us to sound like the Whitney Houston or the Green Day. They're all perfect. That is crap. We want a gift. So when a fan is listening at home and they hear, oh, what happened there? Oh, I heard a stick click on the ground. That is a gift for the fan, a special thing <laughs> you can't hear on the Whitney Houston. And I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, okay. maybe that's too generous a gift. Yeah, too generous. <laughs> <laughs> I like the philosophy, but yeah, like <laughs> you dropped a stick, bro. I mean, that's you hilarious. You even keep time when you dropped it, dude. It's like, come on, man. And <laughs> you I could be like home and telling the guys, and they're like, 
you're like, well, mm-hmm. we're punk rock, but that's no, you don't keep that take. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, and what if you keep the take and you're like, okay, we'll we'll do it, we'll be punk, and then later on you're just kill, you're kicking yourself because you're like, this is a bad idea. Now yeah. everything sounds terrible. So many times. Houston or the Green Day. <laughs> but I mean, obviously, you've been through it all. You've been through the probably the sloppiest band ever mm-hmm. to super. I mean. Mm-hmm. As punk as they can be, but you know some punk bands are really good musicians and really yes. tight, and they hit hard. So yeah, you've probably seen it all. What's, there was uh, one time I I remember a band came in. They were on tour. I don't remember now which band it was, but they stopped in. They were they were they weren't a band that you probably even remember anyway. But they stopped by Lafayette while I was recording um, Social, and so it was like the hmm. the biggest work on song, the one that ended up in the Mallrats movie, and. We were actually sitting there recording it when they walked in, um, which was pretty much one drum take. You know, what, the lead vocal was one take. The singer drove in and came in and sang it, and he left. <laughs> that was <laughs> it. Um, so it wasn't like we spent a lot of time on it. And and the band really loved the way it was sounding. And they go, we want to leave it like that. Just leave your drum set up, leave your bass set up, leave everything set up. We're right. going to just use your stuff. I'm like, okay, cool. And they came in because they were, they were coming in to record really soon. And they came in and played on it, and it sounded like crap. Yeah. And that what made me realize, if you can play tight and solid, the same crappy instrument can sound good. <laughs> Absolutely. The trick is not the instrument. <laughs> the trick is the playing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the most the most obvious one is drums, right? You, you, some drummer will sit down, and you, you, know, you tune the drums. It sounds great. And the drummer sits down, and it sounds terrible. And like, what is going on? I was literally just talking about this with Sam Pira last week. Um, he's a producer in California. He's done like the story so far and uh, a day to remember, stuff like that. And and he was, we were talking about that exact thing about how one person hitting it different makes it sound completely great or completely crap, depending yeah. on who it is. Hitting it in the right place, hitting it with sufficient intensity, because a drum, if you want it to sound like it's getting the, the heck smacked out of it, you got to smack the heck out of it. Yeah. But also in a controlled manner mm-hmm. that's relatively consistent from stroke to stroke, and then the same relative place on the drum. Otherwise, you know, you move slightly over to the edge, you're going to not be in the same pitch anymore. I mean, you could do it on purpose. Like if yeah. you purposely want to change pitch, that's a different story. But if you're trying to sound like crack, 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 well, you better be cracking it in the same place with the same intensity. You know, yeah, musicianship matters. You know, it's. Uh, and when your guitar is super distorted, it might be harder to tell the subtleties of tone. But man, can you tell when someone's munching the chords? Because mm-hmm. the more distorted it is, the more you can hear when it's out of tune. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like. So yeah, musicianship does count, even in punk rock for sure. I agree with you, 100%. <laughs> yeah, it's funny, you know. Think about like the music we play and the music we all play is is punk rock. It's four chords and the truth, but it really isn't that easy to do. Like if you put on a good show and you're you're doing those downstrokes, you know, and you're you're getting a workout, you know. <laughs> so I just embrace it, honestly. Like I, the same thing with you know training for my voice. I train if I have shows or a tour coming up, I make sure that I'm not going to die on stage, whether whether or not that's just singing a lot, being limber, moving, stretching. You don't have to, like, go crazy and, you know, go to the gym every day necessarily, but a little bit of physical, I don't know, stretching. Just stretch out your body and get it moving. I, that's important to me as, a, as somebody that performs punk rock music because I like to just run around the stage and get crazy and run into things. But yeah, uh, it is physical. It's very it's physical. physical. Yeah, it is. And you know, as we get older, that physical stuff. I mean, you know, I'm I'm, I'm a few <laughs> years older than you, but it gets harder and harder to do. You know, it's like, so this this last year with that kind of thing in mind, I was like, no man, I got to get back in shape again. So I started riding my bike a lot more, and I'm like, maybe that'll help. But that's a really specific kind of mo- movement, mm-hmm. and I think. I have a strap of bass on myself and I start jumping around, I'll really quickly have sore knees and you know, you yeah. gotta get in shape for that too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's, there's, uh, unfortunately, like practice is, it's similar to like sparring. If you're not like 100%, if you're just like practicing fighting, it's not the same as getting into the ring. And I feel like that's mm-hmm. the same as a show. It's like you're, you're at practice and you know the songs, but that feeling of doing the songs at the same time almost like being 
in a boxing ring, being battered by the show, <laughs> whatever it is. It could be bad monitors. It could be like super hot and sweaty. It could be all of those things. It could be like the crowd keeps jumping on, which is fun. You want the crowd to be crazy. But sometimes people knock over microphones into your teeth. And yeah, it's <laughs> yes. just there's there's all these things. I always love that. Remember that Green Day video where they're like in the locker room behind backstage going, all right, we got to go out there and do this. And it was like a like a basketball game. But you didn't see that video, but Green Day, it was like, I think it was on uh, whatever album was after Dookie. Nimrod. Insomniac. Insomniac or Nimrod, one of the two. Great video, though. We we always loved it because we're like, that's totally what playing a show is like. You know, you like have your game plan before, you know, your set list. You're like, all right, let's go out there. Um, A lot of times bands will have like an intro uh, all right, let's do this during the intro, and then like, okay, when the lights go down, everybody's gonna be here. It's just kind of funny, you know, to think about. But it is true. It's a it's a thing that that uh, that is fun, but also a lot can go wrong. Oh yeah, and you look, and you especially if you think of something like Green Day, where they've got pretty big, full on production style versions of yeah. songs that they do live and everything. It's it's really cool to see. I'm really, I mean. If I say I'm proud of them, it sounds like I'm patronizing. I don't mean it that way. I mean it like I'm just really proud to see that one of the bands from our punk scene has become really the modern day Beatles. You know, I mean, I don't want to sound like I'm overblowing it, but I remember uh, Billy Joe and I co-produced the the Riverdale's debut album. And when uh, he and I were mixing doing the tracking it's just funny i just found the lyric sheets i have for that <laughs> little notes on it from billy joe like this is kind of lame do this over <laughs> you know, like that billy joe wrote on it and stuff. yeah yeah um but uh uh anyway we we were working on that album so we would mix a song and then we would go for a ride in his his car he had a ford fair lane so he's like want to give it the fair lane test and i'm like sure so we'd hop in his fair lane we'd ride around berkeley and we went up to this rock at the top of the city to look out and we started talking about life. And then he shot out this whole plan for me. He's like, we're going to do at least another couple of straight, you know, Green Day records using the kinds of songs we've been doing, you know, not get too crazy. But then I want to start going nuts and do like this dive like the Beatles did where we have, have a song that has violin on it, a song that's like totally acoustic, you know, and bring in strings maybe, you know, just kind of just do something different where it still has those punk songs, but it's got all this stuff together. Like it's more orchestral. And I remember him talking about it thinking, that's pretty cool. I wonder if that's going to happen. And then boom, he did it all. And the band just got cooler and cooler as far as I'm concerned. (laughs) That reminds me of what your dad said. Like punk was here, but they, they stayed in the rules so that they could break the rules. They like defined their own rules and then they broke their own rules. Yep. And it meant something when they did it because they knew the rules. They were the masters of the rules, but then they broke them. And it was meaningful, like you just said. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's, yeah, 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 yeah. I, uh, yeah, I really respect them quite a bit. You know, um, it, you know, and it's funny because they're younger than me. They're probably a good six years younger than me, and, you know, but I look up to them. At, you know, at this point, you know, like, who's had the more lasting influence in the world of music? Definitely them. Uh, I remember when they were mixing Dookie. Um, the engineer that was mixing it. That was the first album he'd ever mixed, straight out of recording school. Um, Jerry Finn. Jerry Finn, yeah. And, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he yeah. He produced it. He was the mixer. But he, uh, he, he was, pro- like, having he, trouble. He produced one of our records as well, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Very talented guy. Yeah, yeah. He was just having trouble finding his groove with the guitar EQ or tone or whatever. And so the band said, call my ass. He'd know what to do. So, oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So he called me. And we talked on the phone. And he told me what he was hearing in the sound. And I'm like, and he played it for me. But I'm like, the phone i can't tell and of course we didn't have the internet like we do now right right whole other era so he burned uh well no he didn't burn a cassette uh, uh, cd he he recorded a cassette for me okay guitar tone on it um like i think it was maybe it was welcome no it was welcome to paradise that was the one he sent me just the guitar from that um and and it had like panned hard left right the two main guitar tracks i mean they had other guitar tracks on that but they sent me the two main ones and he said see what you think i should do and so I just ran it through my board and I started playing with the EQs and seeing where I found my sweet spot. And I said, hey, dude, I think you might want to push up the 400. It feels like it's a little thin in there. Like go to 400 hertz, one octave range, boost it a little bit, then cut a little bit lower than that. Um, and I think it'll sound more in balance because it's feeling a little kind of 
chesty or something weird down in the low end. And I told him what I did. And then he called me and he goes, let me make sure I understand. Is it going to be this? And he plays it from over the phone. I'm like, I can't tell anything over the phone, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, those are my suggestions. Start there and then change whatever you think you need to. Because I, you know, obviously if you're doing this, you know what you're doing, man. And then he sent me a mix, the first mix of Welcome to Paradise. And um, I said, to me, the guitarists sound killer now. This sounds awesome. You know, go for it. And it's funny because Dookie at the time sounded like the slickest recorded and mixed punk record that sounded like it was sounded punk still to me. Yeah, right? yeah. Slick. Of course, nowadays you go back and you compare it. You can hear little places where things distort that aren't supposed to, you know, or like there's a snare. There's like that, gate. There's gates in there. They're like, wait, yeah. that's a gate. Yeah, yeah. You can hear the gates. That's all right. Whatever. I mean, it still sounds great, right? I mean, yeah, it sounds amazing. But you know, it doesn't sound slick in the way that American Idiot did, you know, ten years later. Right. Right. You know, or if you compare it to, uh, oh gosh, what's the album that came out? Um, not the most recent one, um, the one right before it, um, Revolution Radio. Um, which is really, really slick. Um, I still love it, but it's it's you know light years <laughs> away from um, from what they did on Dookie. You know, because Dookie's a a good band playing live with an engineer not doing a lot of trickery, just kind right. of setting Cap- cues and going, just you balancing know? and making it all pop, low end hits, everything. Yeah, high end hits. I mean, it sounds real and it sounds clean and it's. A great band playing well, you know. So yeah, what, yeah. What could you know? How how could that be bad? It can't be, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, American Idiot sounded, yeah, it, it fantastic, sounded yeah. amazing. Just hit so hard when that came out. It's still I my remember. benchmark. Oh. It's twenty years old, but I still think like no album should be louder than that. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and it sounds really good, you know. So you know. The, the kick and snare beat you in the chest when they hit, and yet you could still hear the guitar ripping your head off. Like, I mean, what more do you want, man? <laughs> yeah. I mean, as as a as a person that loves punk rock, I love hearing, you know, albums that sound not only are great but sound great. Just a great kick, a great snare, great vocal tone. I mean, that's everything. You know, that's partly why we ended up making making our record with Jerry Finn. Uh, the Ever Passing Moment was a record, and um, you know, just listening to his pre-productions or previous production, not pre-production, <laughs> uh, previous productions, he did uh, Smoking Popes, Destination mm-hmm. Failure, amazing record. Um, that, that to me, that to me is kind of like the Wildflowers of Punk, uh, Tom Petty Wildflowers album of Punk, because. It sounds like you're in the room, like when you listen to Wildflowers, the song, that song in particular, by Tom Petty, the drums, do, 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 you know, whatever it does, it sounds like you're right there sitting in the studio with the drums. And to me, it also sounds like that with that Smoking Popes record. So, um, and Head Trip in Every Key by Super Drag was another record that we listened mm-hmm. to that he had done, that Jerry Finn had done. We're like, yeah, this is, this is, let's go with him. But, um, yeah, such I mean, a talented guy. It's such a pity that he died so young. Yeah, I know. It's so sad. And and it's, it's funny. It's not funny. It's it's strange that like so many conversations lately have been bringing up Jerry Finn because he's done some amazing work still. You know, it's mm-hmm. like he's it, yeah. I, I I can only imagine what he would have done if he hadn't passed. Like how oh, many, yeah. Where you know I, who else made would make records with them because he he was making records with Morrissey. He was getting out there. He was he was getting bigger and bigger. It's just so funny to me to think that a guy like that who's been gone a long time now, who had gotten so big, at on the first album he mixes out of school is calling me asking for advice. <laughs> like, yeah. How old am I? Like am I that old? <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, you're no slouch, man. You've done an amazing, a lot of amazing records, and like I said, one of my favorite punk records you recorded. You know, so you know you have a lot to be proud of, and and you're doing amazing things right now. Still, you're moving to Rome. <laughs> Nobody just moves yeah, to Rome if things aren't going well in their life in Lafayette, Indiana. Yeah, you know, I, I still I still love Lafayette, but you know. 
but Rome is uh, pretty cool. I'm, I'm, I'm actually really excited about that. And, uh, um, the kind of work I do there is uh, going to be pretty fun too, all linguistic related. And, um, I feel like, uh, the li- literary side of my background, I haven't been able to do as much with. I, I um, actually got a, a really cool uh, proposal to um, write a book for a publisher who's the most important publisher in my area of academic study, you know, having to do with Don Quixote and Cervantes. And I mean, it wasn't like here you're guaranteed to for it to be published, but they, they discussed with me preparing my dissertation for book form with them. And I just haven't been able to finish it because, you know, there's so much stuff going on in life, you know, and I'm like, ah, yeah. I want to do that, you know, um, cause I've got that in me, but you know, yeah. How do you find the hours in the day? So <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sure you will. I have no doubt. And I appreciate you taking the time to even talk to me out of your super busy schedule. Oh, I, I can't even tell you how excited I was about it. I'm like, uh, you know, like I said, like we've had, had these close encounters, even the one that we haven't talked about, the, when I, I was told that I was going to be playing a show with you in the oh, same band. Yeah. I, honestly, I, I don't have any recollection of that happening. I don't I was, think you were told. I don't think I was told. <laughs> <laughs> because that I probably would have been like into it. <laughs> I thought it would have been pretty cool, you know, because uh, the, the promoter, it was a brilliant idea. He comes to me and he goes, yeah, yeah, Rich's Camp came to me with this idea, you know. And I'm like, what? Like they want to do like some special set, like just, a, you know, four or five songs. Um, with Richie on drums, you on bass, you know, and then Mike Herrera, because he's in town, you know, he's across town on the same day, coming in and doing the guitar, because he could play guitar. I'm like, I thought he was a bass player. And he goes, yeah, but he's touring as a, you know, solo act, so he's playing guitar, so he can play guitar. And I'm like, okay, cool. I'm like, I know he can sing, you know, for sure. So, yeah, that would be awesome. And and uh, I guess they want, you know, they were going to have it split up four or five songs, kind of, you know, where you would sing one, he would sing one, you know, that kind of thing. I'm like, that would be so awesome. And it was so, to me, it was painted like it's almost a done deal. Yeah. <laughs> and so I even told my buddy, I think I mentioned him to you, Sean, you know, he worked at the studio with me. He's an engineer and uh, he's a huge MXPX fan. And, and, you know, he knows everything you've done. And so I told him about that and he was like, oh my God, dude. <laughs> Like, I really want to hear this. And, and then, of course, I'd say, sorry, dude. The, uh, the promoter came back and said, it's not happening. But he made it sound like you passed. And I'm like, hmm. I think, <laughs> you know, I know I don't know Mike yet, but I know a lot of people would know him. And I think he would have probably called me and said, oh, man, I really want to do it. But it wouldn't have been like, no, dude. It would have been more like, I can't, you know. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Click or, or something like that. Or he would have said, yeah, hell yeah, let's do it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I and I don't even remember what that was. I, I have done a couple things like that. I've done, I played bass for a Black Flag tribute at South by Southwest with like the drummer of, of, uh, of, uh, not Limp Bizkit, uh, <laughs> I'm, sp- I'm spacing out now. Um, hardcore band, um, let's start today. Gorilla Biscuits, not Limp Bizkit. Oh, yeah, Gorilla yeah, yeah. Biscuits. That's- much better than Limp Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> well, depending on where, if you're in Europe right now, you might be like, nah, Limp Bizkit, I'm good. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it was, it, was, uh, it was Zach from Rise Against and, um, and uh, the singer of the Crumb Bums, I can't remember his name, but he sang. And I played bass, so it was just us four. And a couple other singers came up, and it was so much fun just doing that. And there was another South by Southwest I did. I played and sang on... Uh, an all tribute record. Oh, I played cool. just a, yeah, yeah. That was I only played a couple, like one song. I didn't, and I sang one song. So well, it's kind of cool because on um, Stefan's uh, solo album, Seven Degrees, of uh, Stefan Egerton. Yeah. You sung a song on that, and I know Chad Price sings one on the same album, or maybe two even. I can't remember. Now, yeah, but I wrote those lyrics too. Like I, like he just gave me the song blank and said, write a song, write some vocal. I'm sure maybe everybody did that. I don't know, but. I don't know. That came out really well, though. I really like that tune that you guys did. And he's so, yeah, that's, that's another super that's a, talented, great guy. Yeah, he can drum, great. he can play guitar. And I think he even, I mean, I know Carl Alvarez is a legend on the bass, but I think initially he taught Carl Alvarez how to play bass. Yeah, and, they were in a band together. And um, and Def, Stefan definitely kind of was the, the guy that brought him in. Um, but yeah, Stefan plays everything. He's an ama- like we were talking about. He's an amazing drummer, plays bass, plays guitar, um, and now 
he had always been kind of shy about singing. Now he's kind of opening up, and he's starting to sing and record his vocals on on lead tracks, and so that'll be probably his next thing will be him straight up just doing a full solo record by himself. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm gonna see if I can great. still wrangle him to play that. <laughs> I th- I'm sure you can. Song. I'm sure you like, can. Just one song, dude. Let's just at least do one song because I. I Mike Kennerty wrote, I mean, I'm telling you, he tracked the whole thing, like in a really good demo, you know, drums mm-hmm. and everything, you know, and he sung a lead vocal, but it wasn't with lyrics. It was like just a melody. And he was like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> kind of like, <laughs> like fake words, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, it sounds pretty cool. I really want to, I really would love to see that finished, you know, and see what, what Chris comes up with on the lead vocal and everything else, but we'll see. Maybe you and I will have to do something different at some point. With yeah. Without Richie. I'm down. I'm down for sure. Yeah, we can do something. That'd be awesome. Well, before we go, is there anything else you want to let anybody know before you head off to Rome? <laughs> well, let's see. Um, I, I think we've talked about so many cool things. There's so many things we could say, but you know how. I, well, come back again and do it again. We'll, we'll, we'll do another anytime. episode. Yeah, yeah. Anytime. And I, you know, definitely if you're ever in Rome, you know. Yep, yep. <laughs> when in Rome, hit me up and uh, um, and same, I'll, I'll, I'll hit you up when I'm out there in the Bremerton area, Seattle area. I'll definitely look you up. And if you're on tour, I'll come and see you wherever you are. Please do. So. <laughs> please do. I, I hope we're, we're back in Rome at some point. We've, I've only played Rome once. Been there a couple times. Um, got stuck in an elevator. With my oh, wife. No. My wife was pregnant at the time. Um, it wasn't a disaster because I lived. We we lived. We're good. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was a little yeah, scary still. at the time. Exactly. But, uh, it's, it's all funny when you've gotten through it, but at the moment. <laughs> and us not speaking any Italian, we're just like ah. But yeah, and no phone. We didn't have our phone. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Oh, so you were relying uh, on somebody actually answering that little emergency yeah, button. Yeah, they did, though. It was it was all right. It was at our hotel, so it was like they got us out. Oh, well, that's good, because at least they understood English, probably. So Yeah, but I loved, but my whole point is just, I, we loved just spending time in Rome, just seeing everything. It's just, it's so different than the U.S. It's yes. different than any U.S. city you can imagine. Like, the most similar, I, I can't even think of anything, maybe like parts of Philadelphia, not, not, not even that. Like just the old timiness. It looks like a painting, you know, when you're walking oh, around yeah. Rome. Um, well, the layers of civilization. I mean, I think though that Philadelphia is a great parallel in the sense that it was the seat of American government at the very beginning of the country. I think that's and the course, vibe. Yeah. Rome's got that same quality for being the seat of the government of the very first massive empire. I mean, the Greeks had an empire, but man, the Romans really took it to another level. So, yeah, I. Yeah, Rome is incomparable. <laughs> yeah, it's hard. <laughs> so even if our, our American empire falls, we'll still be all right, right? Because Rome's doing yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure The Roman was a... empire is gone, but Rome is still cool. <laughs> yeah, Rome is still good. I'm sure there was a lot of terrible things that happened between that. But oh, we don't need yeah. to get into all the his. I mean, his, history is fun for me, but we'll, we'll talk about it another time. Next, Maybe next a- podcast. After you're living there for a bit, we can get into some Rome stuff. Anytime, my man, anytime. It's been great chatting with you. Thank you very much for calling me or writing me and having me on. I Absolutely. So glad. And I'm so glad I could tell you the story of these uh, almost encounters and projects of ours. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I'm glad we finally did it. I knew that guy was a flake. <laughs> <laughs> that dude that said we were working together and then pulled out on us. Ah, oh, man. Right. At least you just justified me on that opinion. So. <laughs> well, I, I, I hope it's not something that I just forgot about and I was a complete asshole or something. Nah, but yeah, there's no way. I didn't believe it at the time either. So I was like, I know, I, I know, I don't really know Mike, but I feel like I do because I'd already been listening to your podcast by that point and all our friends in common. So I, I'm like, he was never reached out to. I just kind of knew it. You know, that had so. to be 2014 or something, maybe 2013, somewhere in there, maybe. Maybe it was when I was on tour with Tumble Down. Uh, we had a, I had a band called Tumble Down where I played guitar and had a full band. I played acoustic guitar. Uh, yeah, I heard I've heard Tumble Down. I like it. It's very like co- co- sort of country. I mean, there's country a punk, punk influence, yeah. but it's very country. Yeah, um, yeah. In a good way, retro country, not like the you know, slicky cheeseball stuff, but the yeah, yeah I it's like old, it. It's I like, like old style. Yeah, I'm, it, I started just listening to like Hank Williams Sr. forever ago, and immediately that was like. All right, I'm writing country songs now. It was 1999. 
Wow. I started writing country songs on the side. Have you ever heard the band BR549? Um, yeah, were, no, I don't think I've heard them, but I've seen that, and I'm going, what is that, you know? Those guys all came from the punk scene, and this is a long time ago, we're talking, you know, Ranking 90s, file late kind of 90s. Stuff or... Yeah, and they did, like, super retro country, like, right when it was starting to blend with sort of rock and roll, and they even did wrote a song about Betty Page, and this is when she was still in seclusion and no one knew where she was. She heard it. And she wrote them a fan letter. Betty Page <laughs> wrote the band a fan letter wow. saying how much she loved the song. And my, and one of my buddies from Lafayette played bass in that band. So, you know, it's just. I'll have to check it out. B, what yeah. is it again? B. BR549. All right, cool. Yeah, that. that it's well, almost like. That. It's almost like my favorite bracket song. Two Rack oh, Foo. Really? Three, or, what is it called? Two Rack. Two Raku. Oh yeah, yeah. Do you yeah, know, I that, know song? that song? It's like a yeah, weird, yeah, yeah. like non-word song. That was another great band you don't hear about anymore, but deserved to be talked about because that they were great solid. Songs. Yeah, we oh, toured with them the a lot. Sound of, yeah. the sound of the recordings, those huge guitars. They sounded so good, you know, at a time when that really wasn't yet a common thing to hear the big guitar like that. But yeah. Yeah, oh man, we could talk forever. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. We'll do it again. We'll do it again. I'm huh? sorry, I did. Yeah, yeah. No, that's it's I love the it. Italian. In you're me. great. You're great. You're you're amazing, dude. Thank you so much. And uh, as always, so Mass Giorgini, everybody. Thank you. Hey, mucho gusto y gracias. Que te vaya bien.